Good evening, everybody. I am Anthony Cook, AKA the Friendly Neighborhood CCC. I am the coordinator of college and career services for the school district of Osceola County, right outside of Disney World. And we would like to welcome you to our kickoff for our College 101 series. Now, if you've been with us the past couple of years, this is something that we do every year where we talk about topics focused on college and career life readiness, especially as it relates to post-secondary transition into a college. So if you're here, you know how to get here moving forward. We have two more of these that we wanna encourage you to jump on to um, next Thursday and the following Thursday. And we'll talk more about what those topics are towards the end. Um, but before we get into tonight's presentation, there are some housekeeping things that I want to discuss with you. First and foremost, we want to thank all of our partners who came together to put this together, who supported all of this. As you can see, they're scattered out <laughs> throughout the state of Florida, all kinds of partnerships that we have from uh, Broward to um, Osceola County, Polk County. We have some Take Stock. We have some Education Foundations, Florida Shines, Abbott. You can see all of our partners. Without them, we wouldn't be able to, to make this happen, to bring this information to y'all. So we always want to give a shout out to them, give them their flowers first and foremost. Next, I want to talk about how to navigate tonight. So if something comes up that's shared with you, you're unsure of, you want us to repeat that, easy all you have to do is use the q a box that you'll find up at the top of your screen type in those questions we have people that are working in the background to answer those questions for you and as we see questions come in if there's ones that are uh, consistent we'll probably address those um, towards the end of tonight's presentation and if we have extra time we'll still take those presentations I'm not going to be answering questions. I'm giving it over to our presenter tonight because she is a goddess in my world. We're going to get to all of that. So we're going to give all the questions to her. OK, I'm just joking. We're all going to answer questions. <laughs> and then lastly, we want to talk about what is also available to you. Tonight's presentation is in closed captioning. If you will hit the CC logo at the bottom right of your screen, you'll be able to follow along with us as um, the words are read out on the screen for you. So those of you that are hearing impaired, please take advantage of this opportunity. With that being said, let me introduce the lovely, the talented, I told you she's a goddess, Miss Amanda Sturt, who is currently working at Florida Southwestern State College. She is the author of Unmazed, and I got the pleasure of seeing her present at one of our national conferences this summer. It was in one of our larger rooms. Let's just say it was standing room only. How do I know? Because I was standing up and the ushers told me I needed to sit my butt down. So this is the woman that is going to be presented tonight. This is the kind of clout that she carries. So with that being said, Miss Amanda Sturt, if you would like to address our audience for the rest of this evening. Thank you, Anthony. And it was so great to, we were over in Austin, Texas, and it was great to see your smiling face. I'm like, Anthony, it was amazing catching up with you. Um, always love College 101. And I'm going to actually start sharing my screen here in just one second. You know how we still struggle even today <laughs> to get the screen up and going, right? Um, but super excited. And uh, just like Anthony said, please put your questions in the chat and they are fantastic at monitoring it, shooting it over to me, or we'll save it towards the end. Um, so as Anthony said, my name is Dr. Amanda Sterk and I wear many hats as many of us educators do. And I'm very proud to be the director of Accelerate Pathways, AKA dual enrollment at Florida Southwestern State College. I've been in that role for, I don't know, it's been like eight years now. Um, I serve 3,300 dual enrollment students. So every question you're probably asking tonight, I get on a regular basis. Um, when I was a school counselor, I really felt that there was such a need for quality information on how to go through the high school to college process. So I just started blogging, writing, um, sending out information to my students, just like a lot of us do, and it turned into a little student workbook. I have one for Florida students, and we just released myself and two new co-authors, um, the national version, which is pretty exciting. And one of the great things being here tonight, all the quite a few of you, it looks like, um, I do partner with our organization called Future 
Makers Coalition, which is part of our local college access network. There's a bunch of them throughout Florida. And we are doing a program right now called Are You Ready? And we're actually offering up a free digital view of the brand new workbook. And it's really only for you guys. Uh, would love for you to jump on there. Um, if you go to this futuremakerscoalition.com slash are you ready? Um, you'll see it right there. It's embedded in there. You don't even have to put anything in. And then we also have some webinars that I'm actually walking you through the workbook. So if you're thinking about any of this stuff, um, would love for you to join us. It's bi-weekly on Thursdays. Um, so feel free to check that out. It's called College Unmazed and we're happy to have you. So let's really get kind of started. So when, you know, Florida Shine comes and says, how do we talk about exploring colleges? Well, the first question that we really have to ask is, why college, right? And so we talk about it and we talk about sort of uh, what we say ROI, which is your return on investment. And when you look at across the board, does education pay? Looking at this graph, 100%. So what we're finding is by 2025, um, there's going to be about 65% of our jobs here in Florida require some type of degree or certificates. Unfortunately, the state as a whole, we're only hovering around about 52%. So we definitely have a huge gap in sort of the education needs of what's going to be available to you as a job. And when you look at this graph, what you're seeing is here in Florida, and this is through the FCAN information, the more education you get, the higher your median wage is. And so if you look at you don't graduate high school, you're making under $21,000 a year, and that is under the federal poverty level. You get a high school diploma, you're barely making ends meet, right? And then you go and you get a maybe a certificate, which could be a short-term certificate. Um, it could be under an AS degree. Um, things like that. Now you're moving up again about $10,000 to almost $37,000. You get a bachelor's degree. The average is about $66,000. And you go on to master's or higher and you're talking about almost $100,000. So if you're looking at the time and the money put into education, it definitely pays. So overall, when you look at sort of a high school student that just graduates and somebody with a bachelor's degree, that's a million dollars difference in your lifetime sitting there on the table. And you're like, eh, not really worth it, right? So it definitely pays to get some type of degree or certificate. And like I said in the beginning, our jobs are going to depend on that. Our, the people, the employees, the employers definitely want some type of degree or certificate coming out of whether it's a, a technical college, whether it's coming out of a Florida college system like FSW, Miami Dade, Broward, um, Valencia, um, or all the way to the state university level at a four year degree or higher. So we know it works. Um, but we're also finding here in Florida, unfortunately, less than half of our students are actually graduating within four years. We talk about the four year bachelor's degree, but only 44% of students graduate within that four year mark. We're talking 56% are taking five years, six years. And when you look at some colleges, um, they're actually reporting six year rates. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not planning for my kids to have a six year <laughs> college education, right? I don't wanna pay for six years of college education. So it's really important in terms of you know, when we work with students on exploring what their options are, that we're not only just looking at, um, oh, what college do I want to go to because it's big and it's got a certain football team or whatever it may be. We have to actually look at what's the career I want and then based on that career, what major do I actually want or what degree do I want? What certificate do I want? What's the actual path to get to the career that I want? Too many times kids just pick the college because it looks fancy and they have really fancy marketing, but they're not really thinking of the end goal. And one of the things that we also want to pay attention here in Florida is we do have something called the excess credit law. And what happens is with those students that don't graduate on time, the state's kind of tired of paying for you. They don't want to pay bright futures. They don't want to give you more financial aid. And so they actually will charge you 
extra tuition, double the tuition if you go on to college for too long and then you lose bright futures, other institutional scholarships and so forth. And so that's a huge loss of, you know, you're overpaying and you're not in the workforce, so you're losing a lot of money. Um, and one of the things that we found in some research is 50% of their of college graduates actually regret their major or their school choice because they get into a system and they don't ask the right questions. So it's really important when you're in high school to start asking some of these questions now, start taking some classes in those fields now, doing volunteer and internships, and we'll talk more about that as we get going. Um, and so that way, when you sort of start going on this path to post-secondary education, you have a much clearer pathway than to sort of jumping on and hoping, you know, for the best. Um, and then lastly, I think what's important is, especially you guys, um, you're going to have a different jobs in your life, you know, very very rarely anymore. I know a lot of our parents, you know, they got a job and they stayed there for 40 years. That's not the case anymore with online work environments, with the hybrid models, um, that kind of work-life balance. You're seeing that your generation is basically projected to have anywhere from 12 to 15 jobs. And that takes a wide set of skills and education to be able to sort of navigate um, what that looks like for you. And I'm sure you probably have followed you know, obviously since COVID, um, that's greatly changed, right? That sort of mobility, what can you do from home? What do you have to go in the office for and so forth? So knowing your career path is really important as part of the process. And one of the things that you need to sort of start asking yourself is talking about this thing called fit. And I really don't like the word fit in the sense of when a lot of school counselors and teachers and whoever works with you, we say, what's your fit? What's your college fit? But we really don't define how do we look at some maybe statistics or some data or some information from the colleges that really match me? Because what works for me might not work for Anthony and might not work for Ashley and all the other people that are on this um, webinar. And so um, what we did in College on May is we broke it down and we said, what are some of the real tenets of fit that we think kids should know? And the first one is really talking about what we call academic match. So academic match is really the idea of a college that um, I'm interested doesn't match who I am academic. So that could be um, maybe my by my GPA, my ACT, SAT scores. It could be, um, you know, how many students they actually enroll, how many they accept. And so basically we also kind of talk about chance of admissions, right? It, am I able to get into that college and will I be successful if if I do get into that college, which is really important. Next, we have career match. So, you know, we talk a lot about majors and we talk about programs and things like that, but there's a lot of things that actually help develop you when you're exploring colleges on what career path you want to go. So what does the college do to actually let you explore that. So do they give you internship opportunities? Do they have a lot of extracurriculars? Um, are you able to go study abroad? Um, is there a, a big alumni network that you can tap into? Do they have a career services that helps you with not only maybe a resume for a job, but maybe also a resume for graduate studies, right? And so career match is sort of, you know, you don't think of it as being 17, but when you're 20, 21 and you're looking for that job, it's even more important. Um, financial match. Now, I wish every family could just write that check and be able to afford college. Fortunately, here in Florida, we are the second cheapest in the nation. I was just listening to a, a, a presentation by FGCU today, and they have not raised their rates in, I think it was nine years, they said, that their tuition has stayed the same, and we are one of the cheapest in the nation. I was at a an event for the future makers the other day and we were asking students like is college affordable and every kid's like no no it's not affordable so i said guess how much our tuition here is our state university they were like 10,000 50,000 60,000 
And I'm like, it's less than $6,500. Um, so a lot of people don't think it's affordable because you're hearing all this stuff on the news. But really, when you look at even like the Florida college system, like at the um, FSW, Miami-Dade and those, you're talking it's $112 a credit. So you're talking like less than $3,500 a year. Um, so one of the things that you need to pay attention to is the sticker price or what we call the costs of attendance, tuition and room and board is not normally what parents pay or students pay. You know, usually you have financial aid, you get grants, you get scholarships, you can have bright futures. So there's a lot of things on top of that, what we end up calling net price. And so really finding universities that one, give a lot of money, and two, that match sort of what you're looking for to make college affordable is a really important part of the explore process. Um, the next one under the six keys is personal match. And personal match is really sort of more that intrinsic, how do you feel about the campus, right? I had a, a student went to, I won't say which state university the other day, and they came back and they said, oh, I just didn't like it. I thought it was too much this and too much that, or they went to another one, they fell in love. Now, that happens, but also, can I drive home? Can I do my laundry at home? Um, you know, maybe is it close to the beach? I would go with the beach, right? Um, or some people want to be up in Orlando and be where all the fun stuff is and work for Disney. And so, you know, the size, the maybe if it's a special mission, maybe it's a historically black college, like an HBCU, like FAMU is. Maybe you want a small private um, Christian university. So all of those things, um, new college, that's part of the colleges that change lives. All of those are things that sort of match a student and sort of their personality and who they are. We have student outcomes, which I don't think students pay attention enough to. And that's basically sort of um, taking the marking, marketing out of college and saying, are the students that are actually graduating from here being successful? So are they being retained? Are they coming back every year? Um, and if they do graduate, are they getting a job? Are there a placement? There's a, a new term, and I, I didn't really know it before, before I started writing this national book called the cohort loan default rate. I didn't know colleges actually uh, posted this and they will tell you how much if people have loans from their institution, how many people can't pay back those loans, which would indicate that maybe they're not getting jobs in their field of study. So if I'm comparing two different universities and one has a cohort default rate of 1% and another one at 10%, that might give me a little question to pause and say, why is that? What, you know, what, how do you actually help me in that career match and help me get a job? Um, and so there's lots of other things. So you could do alumni earnings, how many are graduating within that four year rate, that five year rate, that six year rate. So those are the some, even though like sometimes data is not very sexy, um, there's some really good information out there um, that you can definitely use. And lastly, student support. I think that this is a very underrated. Um, part of the process and I think it needs to be further up in your things to look at in a college and really that is once I'm there what services to help me be successful so maybe you're struggling in math what does it take to get a tutor at that university or that college um, maybe I want to change my career path and I need advising and I want to make sure I'm taking the right courses how do I go about doing that what if I have a 504 or an IEP and I need my accommodations, or I just want to make sure I have them if I need them. So what does their adaptive services look like and how do I actually access that? What about mental health issues? When you're talking about one in four adults have some type of severe mental health um, problem, what does it take to go visit their mental health counseling services? And these are all things that are super important because if you get stuck, is the institution going to help you get unstuck, right? Because you don't want to be part of that, um, you know, population that doesn't graduate from college or graduates after too long and gets that double tuition. So um, those are just really important things. So when you talk about fit with your with your counselor, with your college support network and your teachers, really think about um, as I'm exploring colleges, 
how am I sort of looking at all of these things now? What might be important to me now if I have say um, accommodations and I really need some extra time and some small um, like a, a in more private testing environment that might be more important to me or if I struggle with writing student support might be sort of a bigger circle, right? And I, that might be more important where for some people financial match might be a more important. So your bubble might not look like my bubble and that's OK. You just need to know that you need to look at all aspects because I think so many times we get so focused on one of them, which is typically can I get in, right? Can I get in and then I'm done? And if I can get in, then everything's great. And there are times I know, Anthony, I'm sure you've had these conversations over and over again where kids get to a school and it's not what they think it is, right? They didn't ask the right questions and they didn't go through that process. And one of the things that I know um, the Florida College system is doing, the state university system is doing, is we're really trying to get kids to start exploring early, as early as high school, to kind of determine what maybe career pathway they want to go into, what department. And so are you going to be in STEM, the science, technology, engineering, and math? Since I run dual enrollment, you know, I help a lot of students with academic planning and trying to align their high school credits with their dual enrollment credits with their potential major. And I say, well, if you're going to be a biology or pre-med or engineering, you better take a lot of math and science, right? You better get going because you're going to be in those for a long time. And so exploring that now and early can really help you make sure that that is the right path for you. Um, do you want to go into business? Do you want public safety? Our criminal justice program is probably uh, the DE kids love taking our criminal justice. We actually have a class where um, we have a little island on campus and they bury a, a dead pig and they set up this whole like crime scene and you have to go in and take pictures and do all the forensics on it. It's like the, one of the number one classes for electives and but that's a great class to say do I like that and do I want to be part of that? Do you want to be in education? And even though it not education is not just uh, teachers, right? Educa educators are across the field. And so what does do you want to be a, a counselor? Do you want to be an administrator? You know, how can you be your nurse or whatever that may be? We got health sciences. So kind of starting to look at which pathway will help you not only in high school, but that sort of transition to college. Obviously, one of my favorite sites is Florida Shines. Um, thank you again for hosting this tonight, but they have these really cool personality um, little quizzes that you can do. And what it does is it gives you sort of what you might be good at or what your sort of personality, including your values and your interests and your abilities is called um, Holland's but what you might or your Holland codes and it gives you this information and it connects you to say, hey, these are potential careers and majors that you might want to go to um, college board. The road trip nation has some really cool stuff and it also has some videos and things like that. Again, if you want to sort of explore um, different sort of career options and one of my favorite, it's not pretty by <laughs> any sense um, is ONET and ONET is run. It's a federal um, government site, so it's a little basic. Um, but there's such rich information and again it has that same kind of Florida shines um, little personality quiz in there and it catches you you know all the things that you could with um, your Holland codes and your personality type what type of careers might match but what they also do is they tell you what the average salary is what degree do you need to do that and if it's a bright outlook meaning is there going to be jobs available in that field? And if so, um, you know, which state might work best for you? So those are all three resources if you want to sort of explore um, career options a little bit more. I think that that's really important. Um, so one of the things also as we're sort of talking about if you kind of know what what maybe, you know, field you want to be in or pathway you want to go into, then you need to decide what's my time commitment? What do I really want to do in terms of 
access accessing education and not all education has to be a four year degree or doctorate. It, it can be some some certificates at your local technical college or your local community college can be very well paying and great. And there's sometimes you don't need a bachelor's degree to have a very high paying job. Um, a few years ago, this is actually I was not in Florida. I was in Iowa and we had a program with our local community college and they were building wind turbines. And it was so cool because uh, we had several kids that got into the program as a dual enrollment student, started the training. I think that it was their senior year. They did a six months after that. They came out at 18 years old, making over $85,000 in rural Iowa. And I mean, they had to climb up the wind turbine, but I mean, it was such a high paying in the in demand field and they were just loving it. And so there's a lot of certificates out there ranging from anywhere from 16 to 18 months that they're directly employable after completion and they're usually in demand workforce credentials. We also have associates degrees. Associates, there's two types. There's associates of science and associates of arts. Associates of science are directly employable. So you go into it and the idea is you take less core stuff like less English and math and you focus more on your actual career. And once you get out of there, you can get a job in that field where an AA degree is more core and that's built Building you up towards a transfer into like a state university and we call those like two plus two programs so FSW has a two plus two with FGCU. Um, you know, Santa Fe College has a two plus two with um, University of Florida, like they have a special engineering program. Um, so there's a lot of those where you can um, start at a community college or a state college and then knock off those prerequisites go into a bachelor's degree. A bachelor's degree is a four year. Your first two years are basically, again, a lot of core and then elective prerequisites to get to your major, and then you can go right into a job. Um, and then you have master's degrees, being a school counselor, to be a school counselor, you need a master's degree. So I needed a bachelor's degree first, and then I could go and get my master's degree and then I would be able to get that certification to be that um, to be a school counselor. And then you have also doctorates. Um, so that could be a JD. It could be in, in law or sorry, JD is in law. Um, it could be an MD. Um, there's lots out there, uh, pharmacy and so forth. So there's a lot of different options along that continuum. And one of the best ways to kind of show how these certificates and degrees can be stackable is nursing is probably one of the best examples because you can start off as a CNA and do a, a brief um, you know, certificate. You can then keep going and get additional education and building all the way up um, with the more education. Obviously, your income starts increasing across the way. And so it's a lot of certificates and degrees are stackable and you can go every step of the way. So for example, at, at FSW, for example, we have a um, certificate in entrepreneurship entrepreneurship. And so you can get your certificate while getting your AA degree. So you're getting a certificate, an AA, and then you're you're putting that on to a bachelor's degree, but you can work in that field as you go because that certificate you got right away instead of waiting all the way in four years. Um, other ones that have similar pathways, if you think of um, computer science has a lot of sort of um, smaller degrees that can kind of build up over time. Um, nursing obviously is a big one, uh, criminal justice. There's a lot of them that you might want to consider. So this is just um, because I talk so much with my dual enrollment students about sort of what the AA looks like to a bachelor's degree. Um, this kind of breaks down a traditional four year degree plan. 36 credits um, and 36 credits would be if you don't know how credits work. Uh, one course in college typically is three credits. So if you take composition one, um, that would equal three three college credits. So if I talk about 36 credits, that would be 12 classes, right? Um, so about 12 courses or 36 credits are 
um, general education. So that's going to be your English classes like comp one, speech, humanities, mathematics, science, social science, and so forth. And then you have electives. Um, electives could be very specific, like those college credit certificates I was discussing. Um, it could be courses like business, engineering, criminology, um, excuse me, foreign language, things like that. Um, and usually those are building up to your potential major. So if I was going into engineering, I would be taking a lot more math and science as my electives because that's what the major requires. And if you haven't yet, learn to be good friends with the college catalog. <laughs> um, it's like, it's not a fun document and there's lots of pages to it. Typically, if you look at UFs or FTCUs or FIUs or whoever, um, you kind of have to find it. But what's really cool is all of us, all of us higher ed institutions have listed out if you want this degree or certificate, these are the exact classes that you have to take to do that. So if you're taking dual enrollment or AP or ACE or IB, you can start looking ahead and seeing, OK, if I take these classes here, how does that transfer and what do I need to be in that major? And so you can start doing that right now, and I really implore you to do that. Um, and so then you're building up those electives, then you have 60 credits approximately towards your bachelor's degree, and you really, that 120 credits is sort of the sweet spot, and then you start getting into too many credits, and then that's where you get into the excess credit law. Now this is, again, a generalization. Some degrees are longer than 120 credits, but for the most part, that's sort of the average um, but, you know, what's kind of sad is even the AA degrees, even at our own institution, um, I think our average credit amount to get an AA is like 75 credits. So kids are going further and taking more classes than they actually need to get that um, degree. So how do we sort of continue to explore, right? The idea is, um, you know, I, I need to kind of think of maybe what type of college I want to go to and what's my sort of six keys of college fit. I want to think about maybe what kind of career would I be good at and what I would like to do and what fits my personality and my values. And then also how much time do I really want to spend on a post-secondary education? Do I want to spend a little bit of time or a lot of time? And what does that look like? But there are definitely things right now now that you can start doing to start answering some of these questions and extracurriculars are probably one of the best, you know, and that includes, you know, having a part time job, um, doing an internship, having um, that sort of work experience, working for your parents, mowing lawns that that's Colleges like to see that because that means you're dependable, you have good time management, um, you're a little entrepreneurial. Um, those are good. Being involved in your community, being active, uh, doing volunteer work, um, you know, finding things that you can become passionate about and really enjoy. Um, also creative pursuits. You know, we want to see kids and students in the arts and express themselves and, um, you know, do things that really let Let's them think outside of the box. Also, we want to see it be nice and major specific courses. So if you're going into say you want to be a pre-med major, I would expect that you're taking advanced biology and advanced chemistry and advanced mathematics at your high school because you want to sort of build up and make sure that you like those classes. Uh, maybe you want to volunteer at the your local hospital system. I got to call on. Excuse me, and take a quick drink of water. And so that's really important to start um, looking for opportunities within your potential field, uh, major field. Um, schools, clubs, activities, whether it's National Honor Society or tutoring for little kids, or maybe you are helping with the psychology club or you're building your own club. Um, those are good things that you can definitely be involved in and showing that leadership, right? Being able to kind of say, hey, I'll do it. I'll, I'll step up. And it's one of the things on like the common application, they will act, actually ask you what's your position in that activity and how many hours per week and weeks per year 
do you spend on that activity, right? And so they would rather, if you have a hundred things that you do, but you're only, it's one hour here, one hour here, that's not really important to them. They want to see that you have leadership and longevity, that you've committed yourself to that. So this idea that you have to do 20 different things at once is really, it's false. Really what they would rather you do is do three or four things and really commit to those things and show passion and dedication to them. Academic planning, again, you know, my role as, as dual enrollment, I feel like this is so invaluable to really sit down and think what is my goals and what can I do while in high school and beyond to meet those goals. So can I work with my high school and do they have an academy program where I could get a certificate and they pay for it and I can do it during my school day, right? And those are amazing. And I know uh, here in Lee County and Collier County and the counties I work with, I mean, I'm blown away at the different opportunities. You know, they have, um, you can be a vet tech, you can get your CNA, you can do welding, you can do HVAC, you can work on your pilot stuff. Like it's crazy all the stuff that they can do. Um, dual enrollment obviously is an option, whether it's at your high school or at your local community college or state college, um, AP, IB, ACE, and then even using your electives, you know, um, using your electives to try newspaper or creative writing or uh, culinary or whatever can really help you sort of decide which way you want to go. Um, because I'm in the field of college credits and dual enrollment, AP and IB, the only thing I can really tell you and really Im implore you to explore is we can't give you credit for the same class. So if you're taking ACE English language and you pass that ACE English language, don't come take comp one with us at, at, your, at your local state college. It's the same credit. And so there is a really neat document. Um, the state has done it. I think it's been out there for what, like 10 years. It's called the credit by examination. And I just always Google credit by examination Florida and it pops right up and it'll tell you if you take this ACE credit and you pass, this is the exact college credit that you get. If you take AP, this is the exact college credit. So as we see more students sort of mixing and matching between all this, which that's awesome, um, you wanna make sure that you're not duplicating your efforts. It, I had a student one time, that wrote me and they're like, I think I've already, um, this this course seems really familiar to me and here they had taken AP Psych and they were sitting in Psych 2012. It's the same credit. And so I'm like, um, well, you're kind of stuck now is past the drop date. So that's something that I would definitely um, encourage. There's a lot of online options. You know, if you're in a rural community or maybe your school just doesn't offer it or you want to try something different, um, there are something called MOOCs. I like that word, MOOCs. Um, it's called Massive Open Online Courses and Coursera is probably one of my favorite edX, Khan Academy, but there are ways that you can explore um, courses from places like MIT and UPenn and Harvard and University of Chicago on a wide range of topics like architecture, um, environmental engineering, mathematics, business, fashion, all those type of things. So really cool. I know my daughter did one from the University of Chicago on, it was like a developmental psychology class and there was no credit attached to it. It was just really for the sake of learning and she wanted to see if she liked that content before she took on a more rigorous like college course. Also, see what's available for you at your school in your community. You know, when they have a college fair, you can start going to those college fairs as early as ninth grade, 10th grade, middle school. Go talk to colleges, get their documents, get their information, and start understanding what it takes, you know, to be a, a college student. Go on college visits. So whether you can do it online, maybe you do it informally. Like, you know, I drive up to say, I have family that lives up in Windermere area up in Orlando and on the way stop by on I-4 
Florida Polytechnic. It's just a really cool building. It opens up and it does the stuff. And I'm like, what's that building? Stop and go see. You know, um, a lot of us as public institutions, we're an open campus. Come on in. Just don't get a ticket. <laughs> Make sure that you park in a place that you can park. Um, but, you know, whether it's a formal tour and you schedule a time and you get on, on campus, doing those college visits is so important um, to really start seeing yourself there as early as possible. Um, look at career program exploration. You know, there's a lot of communities have some mentorship programs or things that you can access. Maybe there's summer camps. Um, you know, there's a great summer camp at FTCU for our local um, five county area and it's STEM and it's just amazing. I know FSU has programs, Stetson and so forth. So definitely check those out. And then also think about sort of after that high school experience, you know, with COVID and everything else, more students are talking about taking a gap year, thinking about, you know, what are some of my, all of my options, maybe doing AmeriCorps or projects ab abroad. Um, sometimes you're not quite ready, but how can I sort of keep that momentum going? Um, to really determine you know what I want to do and where I want to go. Oops, let me go here, I think. Um, so one thing that I think we still got some time here. Just some um, kind of key words. Um, I had a bunch of text here and I took the text away because I'd rather sort of talk about them, but they're really sort of there's more programs than just nine, but I think these are some that we, we, you should talk about and explore as options. So I've already talked about the two plus two programs. Those are when a Florida um, you know, state college um, partners with a Florida State University and they make a nice easy pathway. So if you graduate with this AA degree with a certain GPA and you've met the prerequisites, basically you have automatic admissions and sometimes even scholarships to attend your local state university. And so that's excellent to be doing that. Um, I know, for example, at say um, FSW, we have some collegiate programs and so they are taking of uh, getting their AA while in high school. And if you graduate with that program, FGCU, our two plus two partner, will give those students an extra $5,000 a year for up to three years to continue their education with our two plus two partner. That's on top of Bright Futures, on top of financial aid. And so all of a sudden when you say, is college affordable? Absolutely. Um, you also have what we call four plus one or three, two programs where blends in an undergraduate degree with a graduate degree. Um, sometimes you see them in architecture or education, um, MBAs. Those are pretty common. One of the things a lot of people don't know, if you graduate from undergrad early, before your four years, you can actually use some of your Bright Futures money. I believe it's up to 12 credits to actually go to a graduate program. Now it's at the undergraduate rate, but still you're still saving that, you know, $7,000 a year to continue into those programs. Um, colleges that change lives, that is a special program that are really focused on um, having a, a different experience, a transformational experience on the college campus, a new college, and Eckert are our two here in Florida, but that's kind of a neat program that are really about, um, you know, a, a learning community that's really tight knit and about sort of that personal growth just as much as academic growth. We also have the HBCUs, the Historically Black Colleges and Universities that are a special mission driven program to serve um, that population, which is they're fantastic for all students and they really um, have a lot of programming and a lot of pride in their culture and what they do. So an HBCU is another option. Um, there's an honors program. So sometimes you might think, oh, I have to go to an Ivy League or a very selective school to get this sort of small teacher or professor to student ratio. Honors programs are nine to one, just like any selective school. So looking at sort of, is there ways I can connect for research and internships and, and really get it connected in with the honors? Um, internships, we did have a little discussion already about that. Basically that kind of work experience and how can I get that early. Learning communities are typically where a dorm might be or a, a class or cohort is created to kind of keep you together, to provide support and connection. 
limited access that's typically in nursing a lot of times but basically it's you start in like a general education program and then after you get your prerequisites then you apply to a program right so our nursing program is like that so you because it's so competitive and so many people want to get into it you take your you go into the college you actually get um you know your credits some credits and prereqs done first and then you apply on the flip side of that there's a program called direct entry which limited access you don't know if you're going to get in where direct entry says if i'll accept you now and if you do all of these prereqs you're guaranteed a spot at the end of that so i would put um direct entry in next to that as well and lastly a study abroad anytime you can go overseas i've lived in nicaragua niger west africa i spent time in germany and japan and i would never trade any of those experiences for anything and so um, getting out meeting other people other cultures is just really phenomenal so those are all little and there's there's tons more right those are just some of the key sort of programs that i don't think students really explore enough that can enrich sort of that college experience. So I'm going to sort of turn it over and really um, we got a good 15 minutes uh, for Q&A. Um, one of the things I do sort of um, suggest um, at College on Maze, if you go to Instagram, I'm trying to post more stuff and really trying to help. <laughs> I'm not very good at it, but I'm getting better as Anthony can probably attest to. Um, but just trying to, it's all just informational stuff and love for you to connect and and get connected there. So Anthony, let's um, turn this off. And I will say these are all some of my former students. And so when I see their face, we have um, the student Denise here went off to University of Chicago and she was a Quest Questbridge student. Same as Franklin. He went to Williams. Uh, Mary here is at Rice and um, Katie here went to Florida Southern. And we have uh, Julie went off to UNF. And so these are just some of my kiddos that make me smile. And this is why we sit here today, because um, we want to see you representing at your post-secondary institution. So I will turn this off and let's chit chat. No, keep it on. Yeah. Oh, keep it. Oh, you mean keep, the presentation? Yeah, the presentation. Uh, no, not the. No, we're, we're hanging like, out no. here. <laughs> I was like, no, Dr. Stirk, don't. No, I have like seven <laughs> questions right here to ask you. No, no, no. All right. All right. <laughs> all right. A, a good one that came up. It's two. There's two parts to this. Please. So I'm going to give you both of them because you might answer it all together. The difference between going to a two year college versus a four year college and your thoughts on pursuing an AA before high school graduation. Oh, wow. Those are great questions. Um, so lots of different things here. So one, I think the two plus two pathway is outstanding. I think more students should do it, whether you're high achieving or sort of a moderate student, it really doesn't matter. I think. Um, the Florida college system is half the cost. So when you're looking at the cost savings and you're looking at the numbers, you're looking at the size and the opportunities at a at a state college, it's just tremendous. And it gives you that support to be successful in some of those universities that I mean, we have universities that are 60,000 students plus. And I know I went off to a four year university and I really didn't get connected at all to my junior year because it was just sort of encompassed you. Right. And um, when you know, having worked for FSW for so long, I just see such a positive trend. And also when you get your AA um, as a what we call a traditional transfer, so you graduate, finish up your AA and whether you have DE credit or AP or whatever, but you finish your AA the universities don't even look at your ACT SAT score. So we're we're fretting over this, we're stressing, I don't have enough high enough scores, I'm not gonna do anything. That's not true. Um, the Florida college system is open access. We have lots of opportunities for all students. So I think it's super smart. Not everybody needs to jump all the way to a state university right away. Um, getting an AA as a high school student, um, I have 350 <laughs> that I work with. Um, that's what we get, about 10% of our population get their AA. The thing with the AA is you need to have really good advising, both from 
your school counselor and the college that you're attending. And I don't think that that connection is strong enough. And I love my school counselors and they do a fantastic job, but their goal is to get you graduated from high school. Our job is to get you graduated with an AA degree. So we're not thinking of, oh, do you have government checked off or do you have American history checked off? We're looking, is your AA complete? And sometimes the information is not the same. So it's really important to understand both pieces of it and to really communicate um, because I see a lot of misinformation from here to here. So as much as I try to talk to the counselors about, you know, updates and civic literacy and all that stuff, um, it's really important that you are managing both worlds and you're paying attention. If you're coming out with 60 credits, do you know what your major is? Because yeah. you're going to be jumping right into those higher level chemistry courses and business courses and so forth. Are you ready for that? And two, have you taken the right prerequisites to be able to do that major, right? Because that's sort of the thing. If you're coming out with an AA, I expect you to go in as a junior and all those prerequisites to be done. You might not be ready or you might not have the space because you're meeting high school graduation requirements. And so while I think it's a great goal to have, I think it you have to be really smart and you really have to understand, am I looking at all pieces? What do I need for high school? That's first and foremost. Yep. What do I need for the AA? But also, am I taking the right courses? Because I would hate for a kid to have 60 credits and then be completely off because I call it like a hamburger, right? So you got the 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 general education, the English, the math, science, that's kind of like the, the fluffy bun. And in the middle, your prerequisites is like the meat. That's what you need to go on. If you have taken all of your fluffy stuff and you don't haven't done your prerequisites for your major, you're going backwards. And it's actually going to take you longer because you get out of sequence of courses. So again, really important to pay attention to college catalogs, pay attention to your high school graduation requirements. So you just have to self advocate for yourself quite a bit if that's going to happen. And, that was a long answer. No, no, that was great. And like where you're going to right, Dr. Sturt, because some of the competitive colleges, they'll recognize some of yeah. your credits, but then they'll make you retake it because Absolutely. they have a specific curriculum that they want you to follow. Absolutely. And, you know, and I tell students, same with AP and IB and ACE, right? They're not going to take your all those credits, right? It's great. And that's what's going to get you into the university if it's highly selective. Here in Florida, they have to take all of your credits. It's state law, right? It's to take those credits. And so um, I've actually had students turn down Amherst at a full ride saying, I'd have to do everything over again and I could go to UF, do two years and then go get my MBA at Amherst and be done in a short amount of time. So some kids, again, it goes back to that financial match, your student outcomes, you know, what sort of fits you as a student. And some students are like, peace, I want to go to Columbia. I don't care. Don't take my credits. And others are like, no, I work too hard for those. So you just have to ask those questions. What happens? ACE is the same way. Not everyone recognizes ACE credits. Um, and if you go to a college catalog at pretty much any state university or any kind of university out there, it will kind of say, this is what we take for AP. This is what we take for CLEP. This is what we take for some of those. And so it's a good question to ask admissions when you are exploring those colleges. Great question. Great response. Great these response. are good. Wow, yeah. these are good. Um, so it keeps coming up in the chat. They're talking about early action. What's the benefit? Do we recommend it? If you want to kind of expound on that a little bit. You know, it really depends. Um, some students are ready out the gate. They've been planning to go to college their entire lives, right? They came out with, you know, trying to plan everything out. And some kids are ready to, you know, really commit and start applying right now. The one nice thing about early action, early decision, it's a smaller pool of applicants, right? So you go from maybe the 40,000 in the general population to really maybe 1,000 or 2,000 because that means your test scores are spot on. It means your resume is really not going to change. Your classes aren't really going to change. And so you're ready right from the get-go. And you're saying, 
you're my number one. Like I really want to go here. So one of the things that colleges looks at, and we actually talk quite a bit in the book, is about demonstrated interest, right? Some colleges, that's important to them. Do you actually kind of show up? And if I give you a seat, what are the chances that you're going to come here? And so applying early action, early decision, provides that sort of information. You're my number one and I want to go here and, and we'll make all you know options available that I can attend. So, but some kids aren't ready. Some kids don't have that score yet. Some are still working on that GPA or whatever that may be, and that's okay. And that's where the priority or rolling admissions, um, you know, I had a student I was working with and they got into LSU with a 2.8 GPA in June <laughs> of this year. Like, I mean, he was late to the game and he got in. And so they are looking for all types of students at all different times. Um, it just depends on what kind of student you are and if you're ready to submit those documents or not. Good question. Um, I feel like every time that we do this, I ask this question. I wrote it down. And I was like, this is deja vu. I swore I've asked her this before. Stackable credentials. Can we just revisit that one time? And my part two of this is because this came up two or three times in the chat. Somebody was asking about, not just somebody, but most people were asking about like computer programming. What would that look like if they were trying to pursue some stackable credentials? Because in our mind, it's that traditional right route, but we know that there are some ways for us to start at a different yeah. space and then use those stackable credentials. So let's talk about stackable credentials and let's use computer programming as an example. Ooh, I'll put you on the spot. Oh, that's a hard one. That's a hard one. I got, I got this. I got this. So, um, <laughs> You know, and again, that's why I think it's important to kind of explain how a degree actually works, right? You have your pieces of your your general education courses, your English, math, science, those type of things, and then you have those electives. And so if you can use those electives in your field of study, like computer programming, um, and I forget, I think FSW, for example, we have a computer program, we have a bunch, we have like information technology, we have a new cybersecurity program certificate that you can get, and those can range anywhere from like 24 to 36 credits, right at that sort of elective amount. And once you finish that, that block of electives, you get a certificate and can be directly employable. And so we had a student, this was a few years ago, he was getting his AA as a high school student, did the computer programming, got a part-time job while he was working at UC, or he was going to school to UCF and he got a part-time job. I mean, he was working just a few hours a, a week and he was making $40,000. <laughs> like, mm. I mean, it was crazy because he, and he got into it. And so when he went to go apply for internships and he went to apply for, you know, um, graduate school, he already had all the experience. I was helping a student a few years ago, actually it was like a year and a half ago, and they were applying to FS, um, they were at sorry they were at uf and they were applying for med school and this is kind of right after covid right perfect mcat scores great kids you know what they didn't have they didn't have clinical experience and what they said is you should have gotten your cna you should have gotten your cna as an 18 year old worked in the hospital setting as a part-time, built those credentials, done the hard work, know what it takes to work in a health, you know, a health service environment. And that would have been, even though your scores are great, your GPA is a 4.0, but you have no experience. And so looking at how can I build those stackable credentials, is really is so key. And there's so many out there um, to start exploring. Again, I, I would, implore you to explore a college catalog get in and it's while it's not sexy at all there's such good information you can see again how many credits do i need what classes do i need and you can start imagining how it might fit together um so yeah so computer programming is definitely one and again, um, they're needing it. I mean, it's I've, I've heard of people at Harvard going back and getting computer programming cer certifications and getting better jobs with that certification than their actual degree. Um, so it's true. And so being having multiple talents and skills in any of the realms, I think is really important. So if you can get a certificate and it means something, by all means, I would definitely do it. OK, I you brought this up and it makes sense to me and you because we've been in it, but 
I want to act like people out here don't really know what this is. So can you expound a little bit more on Road Trip Nation and the resource Road Trip Nation provides? Wow. Um, I mean, you could probably talk a lot more about it. I mean, I, I use it more on a precursory than maybe other people do. But basically what Road Trip is part of College Board, which we all know College Board, SAT and, and Big Future and everything like that. And what they have done is they've gone in and they've actually talked with people um, that are in the field and they've done videos and they've talked about the career and so you're really able to access this huge bank of sort of a career options videos people talking about what they do and it's really and it's done well it's fun it's it's you know lively it's not like super boring um so i mean that's what i would add to it do you want to add any more to it anthony you probably use it a little bit more than i do actually no that was good i mean it okay. was students that decided yeah. they was going to literally tour the United States and interview everybody that they could mom and pop CEOs rappers dancers <laughs> engineers everybody so um we're at the end of time so we're going to stop there even though these questions keep coming in we're trying to be respectful of time otherwise we stay on y'all stay on here with y'all for like another hour or so Many of y'all were asking about financial aid, and part of the reason that we didn't discuss it here is that we actually have a session. It's our last session, September 29th. You jump in the same way that you jumped in tonight. We're going to go a little bit more in depth on what that looks like. We'll cover all types of financial aid um, and answer many of the questions that y'all put down in the chat for that. And then our next one is the whole application process, because y'all thought the enrollment process was a challenge when we start getting into the application process it's equally if not more difficult so we want to make sure that we spend time on that next thursday as well so dr stark thank you for being on thank you for presenting thank you for building all of these questions and to the rest of y'all have a good evening and if you want to scan that qr code and bookmark that um website that way you can jump into our next few ses sessions thank y'all for being on tonight enjoy the rest of your evening Thank you.